The Feudal Future Podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Feudal Future Podcast. I'm Marshall Toplansky. I'm Joel Kotkin. And today we are delighted to have three experts in the area of higher education with us as we dive deeply into this really important issue. Uh, we've got Rick Hess, who is uh, the senior policy analyst at the American Enterprise Institute in the education policy area. We've got Justin Dyer, who is the executive director of the Civitas Institute at the University of Texas. And to my left, we have Dean Andrew Mosier, who is the dean of the communication school at Chapman University and a renowned mathematician. Maybe notorious, but... <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome, and we're delighted to have you here. Joel, you want to start us sure. off? Uh, let's just say um, that we can all accept that the last few months have not been the, the, the greatest moments in higher education, uh, given what's been happening on campuses, but this has been building up for a long time. Well, uh, uh, one of the things maybe uh, we could ask you, because, you know, the, in Texas, it was um, from the legislature, right, that the uh, that the reforms are. Are we seeing, at least at the public university level, a pushback by legislatures against what's been happening on campus? Yeah, you've for sure seen that in, in public institutions like the University of Texas, where the legislature has been involved and this is, as Rick said, has been a long time coming. Over the summer, there was a Gallup poll that showed that, you know, the headlines were all that public trust in higher ed was at a historic low. And it was something like 36% of people who said that they had a great deal of confidence in public higher education or just higher ed generally. And that was all pre-October 7th. And so I haven't seen any of the recent numbers, but it's it's gone from historic low to new historic low. And it's a real challenging time to be in higher education, but the state legislatures are involved. The boards of regents are involved. I think it presents an opportunity for public institutions that are, is not exactly there for private institutions. They're more insulated from that kind of pressure. Uh, well, maybe we have somebody with well, a private <laughs> institution. Speaking of <laughs> private institutions, <laughs> as you look at, Drew, as you look at it from a private institution perspective, first of all, are, are private institutions feeling the same pressure? And what's the underlying factor here that you think we need to deal with most? Well, there's, there's more than just this uh, erosion of trust, or a, and it's been pretty precipitous over the last five, six years. And as you mentioned a little while ago, uh, Rick mentioned that it's not only conservatives. This is about something like 9% of a shift in people who call themselves progressives who now claim to not trust higher education. 9% is a big, a big cliff. Uh, at private schools, um, another thing that we there's a lot of conversation about is the demographic cliff as well. There, there's going to be, as of next year and the following year, a very sharp decrease in college age uh, students. That's coming down the pike, and smaller schools are really frightened by that. Um, one of the things that growing up, it seemed to me that. I always thought that the, one of the strengths of higher ed in, in, the, in America, as opposed to other places, was the diversity of offerings. We have little liberal arts colleges. We have big liberal arts colleges. We have, you know, public schools of all kinds. Um, and that was really, that was a really valuable thing. And I think that was one of the strengths. And I'm hoping that that continues to be a strength because it means that some schools will adapt and find ways to deal with the current environment and others may not, but I think having a, a base of diversity is is actually a pretty healthy thing for the U.S. Rick, I, I, I'd like to just ask, do you think that there will be actually a lot of schools that are going to go out of business or merge? Is that all, That's already started, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah, you see, I mean, one of the things, people, people tend to think of the same couple hundred colleges and universities when they think about American higher ed. Right. They think about this, you know, the well-known state universities, the privates, but you know, the, the the 300 universities and colleges that we think about enroll something like 10% of all the kids in higher ed. The lion's share of kids are in all those regional and, and access institutions that you've never heard of. Now, the funny thing is the campus craziness, the ideology, uh, the really troubling stuff is mostly going on in those name brand institutions. 
they're not the ones that are looking at going bankrupt. They've got endowments. They've got powerful alumni and state legislatures. They've got deep pocketed supporters. The folks who are getting shaken out are these either, um, you know, uh, hand to mouth kind of little private institutions or these public uh, regional and access institutions that are facing pressure to consolidate because of demographic shifts uh, or budget pressures. So that that's a reality. But when we think about the pressure on universities to start to address some of the really toxic behaviors, the hypocrisy around free inquiry, um, the politicization and agendas, um, that's not coming from the marketplace. Uh, that's really going to have to come much more directly um, from political pressure, from alumni and boards getting involved, uh, or from legislatures and elected officials um, starting to lean in on public institutions. Well, you know, it seems to me that one of the issues that we're not really addressing yet, and I'd love to get everybody's opinion on this, is that beyond the demographics, beyond the political pressure, is the fundamental value proposition of higher education, mm. right? And, you know, you think back to like my era or in all of our eras, the notion of getting a college degree or an advanced degree was your ticket into the leadership class. And it seems to me that that value proposition has been eroded somewhat. What, what do you guys think about that? I think a lot of the problems we're looking at are related. So there's been this trend toward an ideological monoculture on campus, and that's happened in discipline after discipline. And you can look at, you know, some of the statistics here, are like 4% of historians and 3% of sociologists, maybe 2% of literature professors are conservatives. There was a study that showed that Williams College for their partisan enrollments, registrations, it was 132 to one Democrat to Republican on their faculty. And that by itself isn't even necessarily a problem if the faculty were teaching bread and butter courses that weren't politicized. But the way that higher ed's become politicized is then part of this problem of the value proposition. So if you come out of a university around the country and you've got a bachelor's degree in whatever subject it is, what does that communicate about the skills you've developed or the body of knowledge that you've mastered? And the answer is nothing really. We'll look for other proxies. You know, maybe they were an honor student, maybe they volunteered, maybe they had a great internship. There are proxies that get at that. But the college degree by itself, I'm not sure tells you all that much anymore. So if we ever get to a point where employers just decide, you know what, we'll we'll do a screening test. We'll hire kids right out of high school if they're really good. We'll train them. If there's another avenue that opens up for those kinds of things, I think higher ed is in, in real trouble. Not the main institutions, the big endowment institutions, but a lot of these regional schools that are already in trouble. You know, and, and just to build on Justin's point here, I mean, one of the things that I've long argued is that we've created um, these barriers that have created real asymmetry when it comes to the workforce. That the problem is going back to this misapplication of uh, the Civil Rights Act of 64 as far as uh, disparate employment and the way it was interpreted in Griggs versus Duke Power by the Supreme Court back in the early 70s, it made it really hard for employers to uh, legally defend employment tests. Um, if, for instance, you have an employment test which requires employees to carry heavy packages and you find that there is a differential impact by gender, uh, the appellate courts have said you can't use that kind of test. IQ tests or skill tests are hugely vulnerable on these grounds. In fact, even though Chief Justice, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court said back in 71, we've got to be really careful not to allow this ruling to do it, be, create a carve out where people, who employers have to lean on college degrees. What has happened is a giant carve out. So even though the people who get college degrees look very little like the US population as a whole, no employer has ever gotten in trouble requiring a college degree. So you want to work the desk at Enterprise Rental Car, you need a college degree. And so what's happened is college degrees have become the go-to proxy, which means if you want to work in Hollywood or investment banking or Capitol Hill, you have to go get a degree. You generally have to go get it from one of those 300 institutions. And this has empowered the folks Justin is talking about to play this role of gatekeeper and a keeper of mores 
uh, in a way that was never envisioned and is completely inappropriate when we think of the historic mission of higher ed in a free society. Well, you know, by the way, I guess we should be thanking the Supreme Court for full employment opportunities for a lifetime for us professors, which is really a, a wonderful thing. But I'd like to ask Drew a question, especially as as dean of a communication school. Are we, despite the fact that people need a college education to check the box, how happy are you with what it is that we're actually teaching in terms of its ability to prepare people for being out there? Wow. <laughs> so is anybody going to listen to this? I, I, I <laughs> the very... five people that listen <laughs> yeah, to okay, this right, podcast right. are going to be outraged. <laughs> no, actually, it, I'm, I'm a mathematician. I came to the School of Com in a kind of strange way that we'll we maybe talk about some other time. But um, I think the product at Chapman in our comm school, because of its emphasis on health communication and on quantitative reasoning, qu quantitative work, um, it's very strong in that score. So I'm pretty happy with the value proposition of our comm studies program at Chapman. On the other hand, as I came to be dean, I needed to study what was going on in other comm programs and ours and understand where it fit. And ours is a much more quantitatively based program than most in the country. Um, and so if well, you, you were know, if you were asking I, me globally, I would say I'm maybe, not so not. sure. But, but I'm pretty confident with what we're doing. Let me just let get a little clarification because I'm intrigued that you would say that it's a quantitative approach to communication. I'm not right, sure right. that our audience actually understands what that means. So give us an example of how you would apply quantitative methods or quantitative Right, fair thinking. enough, fair enough. Uh, so when, when you're thinking about message design, which is a course that everybody needs to do, right? what you wanna do is say, well, look, I have these different ways of formulating the message of this corporation or this organization or this, this nonprofit or something like that. So different different formulations of our basic message. And you wanna know what's effective, so you really test it. You really go out and test it on focus groups for one, or if you can, if you can manage it, larger surveys, things like that. And it should be informed if it's done right by some hypotheses ahead of time. You don't just collect data and then say, here's how it goes. You form hypotheses about which messages will work based on some theory. Moral framing, do you, is, if you're trying to get people to stop smoking, is it better to say smoking is going to kill you or is it better to say stop smoking is healthy for you? Those are different messages. And there are different theories about how that works. Or is it better to say this is good for your family versus good for you? So there's several things you could ask and then you can really gather data about which things work cognitively better. So, so that approach, And that's the kind of strength that our faculty happen to have. Yeah, yeah, that's... I'd love to open this up to uh, to uh, uh, the other guys on this, but it strikes me that your approach here is kind of it designed to give our students a broader range of skills than what they would get in uh, you know in a more narrow approach, and and that that brings up the question of generalist versus yeah. specialist education, mm -hmm. and I wanted to get um, you know uh, your your impressions of that. Is this a trend that we're seeing now in education, in higher education, to have more integrative, more broad sets of education? Or are we um, continuing to be very specialized in, in what it is that we teach? It's probably a little bit of both. So the disciplines have become more and more specialized over time. And that's not all bad. Methods have become more sophisticated. We probably have a much deeper body of knowledge in some area. And the faculty teach what they want to teach. And so they're often teaching more narrow, specialized courses. When we've traded that kind of depth, we lost the breadth that we used to cover in general education. And so there is a push to do more interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary things. At University of Texas, we just started a new school of civic leadership, and we're proposing a new bachelor's degree in civics. And a civics degree really is, it's the ideas that go into building Western civilization, it's the American constitution and it's our political history and how our economic system works. And that's the kind of broad base of knowledge we would hope that college graduates would have, that they would go out into the workforce and have some cultural reference points and they understand their civilization and they understand their institutions and where they come from. And if they want to criticize them or reform them, they should at least understand them first. The other 
Can I ask a question? Can I jump in and ask yeah, a question please. for you, Justin, about, about that very thing? Yep. Um, I Earlier, I advocated a s sort of similar um, emphasis in citizenship and, and so on in our, in our GE. Um, and the rejoinder that would, which really killed the idea was that we were moving toward emphasizing um, foreign students. Mm -hmm. and, the, I, and the argument, which I found really, really insane, was that those students are not interested in the American Constitution, or they have such a wildly different concept of citizenship, and who are we to tell them what citizenship means, and so on. So the, so the idea died. Yeah. How are you addressing it at UT? So, I mean, are you are you hearing that critique, and how would how are you addressing it? Yeah, of course, have foreign students, but it's a little bit of an easier case to make because we're a public institution chartered by the state, created by the mm -hmm. legislature, and our founding mission is to create people who will be leaders in our communities. And so we deliberately try to get a wide geographic representation among our students. We send them back into their communities, and the motto of the university comes from one of the first presidents of the Republic of Texas giving a speech about education to Texas Congress. And he says that cultivated mind is the guardian genius of democracy. And that becomes our Latin motto. And it becomes a kind of justification for the university's existence. And this goes back to the University of Virginia and other places. Public higher education has always really been focused on that kind of civic education. You, you know, um, one of the things that Justin mentioned was this question of interdisciplinary kind of engagement. And so you hear a lot of talk about this today at campus. It's, it's just, but I think what happens is it frequently, you know, it focuses on the symptoms rather than the issue. I mean, I think one way to understand so much of the problem in higher ed today is it's Woodrow Wilson's revenge. Um, what we have done <laughs> is we have fixated intensely in higher ed um, on expertise and we have lost interest in wisdom. Uh, in historical perspective in any conventional sense. So when you read what gets published today, leaders in any disciplinary field, I think, Justin, your field was political science like mine. You know, what you get published with today is esoteric econometric formulations or critical theory jeremiads. Um, a few decades ago, leading lights in political science were folks like Edward Banfield, Hugh Hecklo, James Q. Wilson, who took as their brief, not just pushing the boundaries of kind of narrow expertise, but engaging and broadening our understanding of institutions, whether it was J.Q. Wilson in Broken Windows Policing or Richard Fenno and the behavior of congressmen and how their home styles varied and shaped the, the, the problems with Congress as an institution. And so I worry that interdisciplinarity, as you hear it talked about, doesn't address any of that. It's just um, narrow experts who are only writing for the other 11 people who admire their jargon now writing across narrow disciplines rather than trying to broaden back out the mission. I think what's exciting for me about something like what Justin's heading up at the University of Texas and similar efforts you're seeing launched in Florida or North Carolina is that they are actually trying to take a step back towards that broader a uh, more wisdom-soaked notion of higher education is something that engages, uh, a, a, the, 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 you know, in the American project, rather than narrowly commenting on it as experts, you know, dropping bits of jargon from on high. Which was Woodrow Wilson's uh, 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 book title? If you haven't. That yeah. that is a great title. <laughs> I'm gonna write the book now, but. <laughs> but, That's the easy but, part. The title's the hard part. <laughs> but the, but the the thing that I I wonder about um, is it seems to me that the if you will the progressive or or radical whatever you want to call it, takeover of particularly outside of the sciences is so profound. I don't know how you do anything about it because I find when we have discussions about you know what I would call classically liberal ideas. Um, I I find that most of the people who, who agree with us are, let's face it, you know, fifty and over. What do we do with the cadre who have now been bolshevized, if you will, and and now dominate whole departments? So that I mean, you can't even. I mean, obviously, an issue of importance to me is Israel. Just to have a 
a, a decent discussion or about affirmative action or about uh, critical race theory. What do you do with the fact that these people are already installed and have almost complete control over the departments? You know, there's there's so many different angles on this that we could talk about. But one of the things that people from outside the university looking in often don't realize is that many of the faculty, I don't know what the number would be, many of the faculty would agree with what you just said. And they also are terrified of the students. Indeed. So when we're thinking about what campus culture is like, a lot of the self-suppression of ideas, the self-censorship that goes on is peer-to-peer -peer among the students. So the students are terrified of what the other students are going to think of them. And then the faculty in the classroom, they don't want to say the wrong thing, have somebody make a complaint against them, have something go viral on Twitter, whatever it is. And so a lot of it is a cultural problem that's developed. But a lot of the students come to the university already with those ideas fully formed. And so there's something deeply challenging about the problem that is it's not a matter of getting a new department chair. It's a K to 12 issue. It's the whole educational establishment. It's coming into the university. Of course, it's how we do graduate training and hiring and who the administrators are, but it's, it's a giant challenge and it's a generational challenge. Yeah. And we're talking about social norms. People are afraid to go up against source. Do you find that here in a, at Chapman with a, with a private school environment? Yes, I do. I, but I think it's probably less acute than it is at, at some public schools. Um, but I also think there's some hope because there's also there's quite a bit of data out there that's saying that y at least younger college age students are starting to migrate away from progressivism and are and are starting to have questions about about what this has meant. So I I just get the feeling that we're seeing the beginning of some changes that are going to be. Well, that are going to moderate things. I mean, I don't need to have a swing in the other direction. That's not going to help either. But but something that's going to moderate things is I, I think it's starting to happen. Um, but students need to not be afraid. Well, I, and I, I don't know what I don't know what kind of critical mass is needed for that to happen. But I think it's maybe not so far away. You, you know, I mean, I, so, so this all this all sounds right. Both you know everything that's been said. Uh, one thing that I certainly hear from college presidents um, is that there's, you know, students, uh, the Surgeon General uh, cautioned last year that the amount of time students spend in person with friends is down 70% since 2003. Uh, students spend much more time online. Uh, you know, the average teen is spending six to eight hours a day, most of it gaming and social media. Mm -hmm. So there's also this sense that they're not, they, they haven't spent a lot of time uh, just engaging in person. So one of the things I've heard from many college presidents is that students seem uncomfortable speaking up in the isolation of a classroom. They feel exposed. Uh, that's one thing they've commented that a lot of students seem to feel more comfortable in protests and rallies because they can kind of, they're, they become part uh, of the mob. So that's one thing. So, so I think there's these cultural dynamics, which we have to attend to, but there are also, I think, nuts and bolts institutional factors. Um, it's not just department hiring and tenure and promotion. It's also the editorships of the influential journals where people publish in order to get build the, the resumes, the CVs, that then let them up compete for jobs. If those uh, journal editors um, are putting a heavy thumb on the scale, that has huge impact. Uh, you certainly see this in the funder, in the funder community. They're the, uh, you know, it's hard to find a funder who hasn't put kind of the code words uh, of kind of uh, of the woke movement uh, into its mission statement, uh, which favors some kinds of work, um, not others. And since we know, uh, you, you know, fellowships and research funding are kind of the coin of the realm, if, you know, if certain lines of inquiry are, you know, favored and others are, are, are kind of disqualified, that has a huge impact. So it's not enough just to think about something like what Justin's heading up. If you create a Civitas Institute in isolation, but you're not thinking about kind of the ecosystem around it, the journals and the funders and the postdocs, um, you're stacking the deck against our ability to bring this thing back into some kind of healthy or heterodoxy. 
Well, let me let me ask you this too, because I, you're you're attacking you're you're attacking the problem from an institutional perspective. Let me switch the perspective a little bit to the student perspective. What I find as a classroom professor is that students, at least my students, seem to be increasingly focused on translating their in-school experience to actually getting a job and doing well at their whatever their chosen career is. And it strikes me that the the system that we have in place that rewards with tenure, the research track professors who have, let's call it less and less relevant research. Wait, excuse me? It. Um, <laughs> I'm uh, right next to you, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, that group is quite out of touch with what it is that's required in the real world in order for students to be successful later on, which is the value proposition they're buying with their education to begin with. Is there any change in sight for that? I think this is the difficulty of trying to get professors to do vocational training. We've not had uh, any other vocation, and so we don't know how to train them for that. <laughs> and um, you know, we don't know we don't know what it's like to have a real job. And so, what we're doing is, or what we classically had done, was we were supposed to train students broadly. And that included the, you know, the old idea of a liberal education was grammar, logic, and rhetoric were the tools that you developed through that kind of education so that you can analyze information, you can speak well, you can think well, you can um, do the kinds of things that are actually valuable in the workplace. And so you can communicate, you can write, and it's very hard to find people who have that skill set. If you have somebody who's competent in speaking and writing and analyzing information, that's a real value added to any organization, but it's not like being a nurse or being an engineer or being a doctor. You have to have a, a very specific kind of education that's technical and vocational, but the broad education is not. And that's where the value proposition has been lost because just because you've gone to college does not mean you have those skills. But if you do, they're actually valuable and valuable in a way that we can't predict whether you're going to go into venture capital or work as a you know, architect somewhere or get into real estate or whatever you're going to do, we have no idea what your career path is going to look like. And we don't know what the careers in 10 years are going to be anyway. So we might as well equip you with these tools that Dorothy Sayers has this old essay called the lost tools of learning. And the idea was what we, what we wanted to be now is you're teaching and her quote, teaching men, not what to think, but how to think. And this is an old mid mid 20th century essay. And she's already complaining about education, but it is, it's not, the transmission of propaganda from one person to another. It is teaching students how to think. I mean, thinking critically is, um, it sounds kind of cliche, but if done well, and if properly equipped to do that, it's gonna serve them well for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Drew, Spe wanna... Speaking as a pure mathematician whose <laughs> his work is about as irrelevant as it's possible to be. Um, I, I did have some experience in software engineering and, and things like that before that. Um, and one of the things that as a professor, I really pay close attention to and I value doing and I think I'm good at is remembering what it was like to struggle with a hard idea earlier in my life. And when I teach, I don't teach sort of, oh, here's this well-formed idea and I've got the perfect proof of it and it's beautiful, which is what we value as mathematicians. I try to model struggling through a hard idea and, and teaching people how to think about mathematics. That's, and, I've, and I get good feedback about that. Um, I, I think that is a way to recover this from the faculty that we all complain about, that you know, you've never had a real job. And a, well, no, actually teaching is a real job, but you have to be thoughtful about it. Um, and another thing, um, well, I'm sorry, I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but... Um, but I think that's an important thing to bear in mind. Oh, I, I was going to say this. There is kind of a volume problem of, of uh, regression to the mean in higher education. We just have volume. We have to hire people to be in classrooms. And so you're going to expect some mediocrity. That's, that's sort of built into the structure of the system. And I, I hate to say it that way, but that's simply true. Uh, and a good university, especially one that's relatively small like Chapman, we can be more careful about who we hire. 
somebody who's a, a you know an excellent researcher, but you really are listening when you're hiring people for the signal that this person cares about being a good teacher. That's something you can do at our volume that's very difficult to do at the sort of secondary state schools, for example. Joel, final question to you. Yeah, I'd like to basically ask the three of you, given what we know is happening, how optimistic are you that things could actually significantly turn around? And will it take not just, obviously, it won't be the universities, only it'll be the K through 12, like you mentioned in the book. Um, are you optimistic or pessimistic, or is this just simply one of those lost causes, and uh, we'll just we'll just have to ruminate in 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 darkness for the rest of our lives? <laughs> I'm kind of an optimist by nature, and so I I think this is work worth doing, and I think cultures and societies can reform very very quickly. If we look back on periods of great change and transformation; it can happen. We can build new things again. We haven't done it for a while. People are starting to build new things. There's no reason why we can't. The K to 12 movement's a big one right now. There's a lot of energy being put into that. I think there are a lot of good possibilities there. And education simply is just, it's not something that we can abandon. And so whether it happens through the old institutions or new ones pop up, it's its a necessity. And so I'm, I'm hopeful and hopeful we don't have to ruminate in darkness for the rest <laughs> of our <laughs> Rick? Um. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, as somebody who, you know, I used to teach high school social studies, for heaven's sake, you know, last century, uh, you can't do this kind of work without, you know, forcing yourself to be an optimist. Otherwise, you just look at the kids and you're like, what the hell are we doing to y'all? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, and I think, you know, you guys were kind enough to put, uh, I've got this new book coming, coming out about now with Mike McShane, Getting It Right. And one of the things we talk about when it comes to higher ed is just like Justin said, there's lots of avenues to do this. In the 19th century, the American higher ed landscape was rich with new institution emergence. I mean, every year through the 1800s, you were seeing a dozen, a score or more new colleges pop up, uh, including some of today's most famous institutions. Um, we got out of the habit of doing that. Uh, even folks who believe deeply in things like free inquiry and the importance of civil discourse, uh, started to write huge checks to institutions that weren't doing those things instead of putting that money into creating new institutions that were. Um, what we've seen over the last six months is folks uh, on boards of, uh, boards of trustees starting to lean on their institutions to actually uphold the values that they claim to value. Uh, I think if we get into that spirit, if folks who are writing checks start to write checks for new institutions or institutions that are serious about the things we're talking about. If legislators uh, lean in and start to say, we're not funding you guys because you have, an, you have a right to public money. We're fighting you guys to serve an important public mission. And if you don't want to serve that mission, we're going to stop uh, letting, we're still going to stop the money flowing. Uh, if folks are more to trustees, I mean, one of the things that's been fascinating for me for decades is you get trustees appointed by, 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 staunch conservative governors and they're good old boys they don't want to cause trouble they don't want to like lean too hard into campus affairs as long as the campus campus president kind of gives them a little bit of uh you know, you know light polish um and they get good 50 yard line uh tickets to the game uh they're happy to let colleges go crazy i think you're starting to see a change in that especially in states like virginia and texas and florida where governors are starting to take the role seriously. So look, I think there's a lot that can be done. Um, I think like with everything else, it always comes back, one, to willpower, and two, to whether we actually have sensible, constructive vision of what we're doing, or whether it's just performative politics. And so that's the challenge. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll see if we're up to it. Drew, Drew final thought for you. Yeah, I'm, I am optimistic, but I'm going to come back to what I said earlier, which is that the diversity of education in, in uh, the country might be part of the savior, but it's going to mean that there, there's going to be pain at some places and there's going to be hard decisions to make. Another thing I want to point out is that you were mentioning boards of trustees for public schools. Um, uh, boards of trustees at private schools, are they, be they typically belong to an organization about how to be a trustee. 
and the literature in all of those, I've read these things because I've needed to, emphasize that the curriculum is the province of the faculty. And so boards of trustees are, are encouraged and in fact, more, not just encouraged, but in, almost instructed to stay away from curriculum decisions. And I think that also needs to change. And it certainly wasn't true a couple of generations ago. Uh, you know, boards of trustees were often populated by members of the immediate community. They were, there were pastors on the, on the boards. There, you know, there was a range of people. Some were wealthy, some were not. Now it's really pretty much a fundraising organ of the university, and they keep their hands off. I think that needs to change. That goes for private schools as well as public. Well, Drew, thank you for your comments. Rick and Justin, thank you for being with us. And I, this has been a really full so discussion. Very interesting. And, and again, really uh, uh, appreciate your giving the time and, and uh, you know, really sharing some really important insights. And we, you know, those of us who live in this, uh, in this soup would like it to be tastier. <laughs> well, and hopefully we'll be able to dive a little bit more deeply in a, in the future episode. And thank you for being part of the Feudal Future podcast. Hey, good to be with you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, we're out. The feudal future.